this is based on the paper actually Miles probably already mentioned a couple of times uh, that he led recently with uh, Ryu Su, also a Princeton graduate who just recently graduated, Peter Battaglia at DeepMind, Alvaro Sanchez at DeepMind, David Spurgle and Cal Kramer, and you know David very well and Cal Kramer from NYU Ferro. We borrowed quite a lump number of slides and pictures from Peter Battaglia, a close collaborator. Um, here is I'm going to start this off fairly easy because I think it's nice in case people weren't listening 100% attentively at Miles talk. Um, how do you understand a scene? This is what everyone does every day where you look at this picture and you try to figure out what's going on and you parse it into sort of physical objects and relations. It's not just the physicists who do this. It's not just the scientists. Everyone kind of does that intuition, intuitively, I think. And you reason about the objects and their interactions and you might even describe it with a word, in this case, precarious. Um, you can describe it with other words, but in this case, or very messy, depending on how it works for your household. Um, what is the mechanism of the human physical intuition? We will have this input of like a bunch of things that might fall off, and you try to move it forward with this intuition in your head. We call it intuitive physics engine. Actually, uh, Peter's group back in the days actually has been thinking about this a lot and they think about whether it will fall, which direction it is. They're kind of coming in from very um, cognitive science direction, but the idea is very similar to what physicists were doing. And they did a bunch of experiments here that were shown and they used their model back then. This is like 2013, 14, 15, and very simple models and see whether the predictions were correct. How well, you know, the humans and the machine can predict whether it will fall, which direction it will fall, when different masses were there, what happened, can you still make the same predictions? Um, you look at the complex scenes when you hit it with certain angle, um, for example here, whether the yellow or the red bo blocks are falling off in what directions, and for inferring the masses, you also can check what masses of each of these blocks by observing in them falling basically. And for predicting fluids, you can predict, and the model have predicted successfully whether there's more water on this side or that side. So they've done all that with fairly simple ideas. And we're gonna talk about this. And actually Miles already talked about this interaction network that uh, you guys have heard. So as a scientist, we kind of go back and say, okay, so we kind of see what these cognitive scientists have done. And realized they built something called this interaction network, which are basically graphical neural nets that has very interesting connections to all kinds of um, network. So can we predict what happened using what we just learned today? And time t equals zero, usually have something like this, a bunch of planets moving around. And for the next time step from here on, you wanna see the next time step, where are all these planets moving? So that's sort of the premise of if I observe these planetary systems moving around with each other, can I predict the next time step properly? Um, usually, or traditionally, we have something like really smart person, or at least that's how the story would be, were told. This is the Isaac Newton supposedly apple tree in his manner. He can sit underneath the tree and figure out how these all related to each other and come up with you know, this traditional uh, classical mechanics law. Um, you can observe the planets moving around. Can we figure out the physical laws that governs the motion of the planets? We can either work super duper hard and came up with it sort of like what Newton's rumored to have done. Or as you have seen earlier, there's some powerful techniques out there. And one of them is called symbolic regression that you just saw some demo. Um, there is a, a long line of history about, you know, that came and related to this symbolic regression you can check out some genetic programming, evolutionary programming, they're all sort of related and not super different. Um, if you haven't paid attention to what is symbolic regression, these are the simple quick summary. Um, we have a bunch of mathematical functions and variables. We can form these new equations. We check this new equation, whether it fits the observables. We move on to the next equation to find better fit. And how you actually do that and how to make it fast is a fairly tricky question and that's how uh, Miles package was actually shown to do really well to find the right equation. And it's a very large space. So how do we combine all this stuff together, right? So now we have a question of how to model a bunch of planets, 
predicting its next time step perform like what are they going to do where are they going to be what's the velocities we can use the graphical neural net to help predict the dynamics first and there's a reason why we use graphical neural nets here um, even before we want to predict the equations because these actually are very closely related to the structure of the problem but what's more interesting is that you can I think Miles used the word pluck out different pieces of the deep neural net so that you can really just zoom into that one piece or two pieces and get the equations out. And that's the part that was quite important why we pick graphical neural net because other type of um, deep convolution that might not have the easy thing that you can pluck out obviously to do the symbolic regression. So now we like to do this in two steps. The first part is just to predict the dynamics, just right here. And you model with the graph neural net. And here's the part, which is the second part, which is extract the symbolic equation, which you actually already see in the demo. The, the part about predicting dynamics is actually not so difficult because it's very similar to all the convolution that you've seen, except this time it's the graph neural net, which you already saw. But I'm going to just repeat things and put them all together. Hopefully that will make a lot more sense the second time around. Um, we make the predictions with the neural net. We compare, we update the weights, and you do this loop again. We're not going to go through all that details again, but the graph, the easy things to remember are their, their nose, their edges, and you can also have these global properties, which we did not use in this particular demo, um, demonstrated our purposes. You can capture them with very many different, I mean, you can capture many different things with graphical neural net, but there are obvious structures that I think graphs correspond to that we immediately respond fairly well with, say, amboy system or molecules. Oh, yeah, I think your system. microphone is uh, dragging on your desk or something. Uh, that might be possible. It's probably in my headphones. Thanks. Is it better? Yep. Um, yeah, let me try to hold something. Okay, so thanks. And uh, Miles already shown earlier all these equations or basically simple um, demonstration of what these different properties are. But just to remind you, we have the nodes and edge functions, the edge functions being here, it compute the messages from the nodes and the edge attributes associated with an edge. So you can update the nodes. You can update the node info from the previous node state and aggregating them all the edges. And the edges can be bidirectional or single directional and you're training it to predict the node states at T1 from state equals to T0. So, so next step, we do not talk about the global block in this particular example, but you've heard it from miles before that you can include that such as the total energy of the system or the total angular momentum. You can possibly also think about um, some of the conserved quantities that people usually talked about such as Lagrangian or Hamiltonian, which Miles can probably also tell you a bit more about them later on. Um, we will look into this very simple case, planetary interactions. Each planet is a node, x, y, and masses. And for each pair of the planets, there's an edge so that it is a fully connected graph. Each edge is a function of the two nodes. And then we can update on each node that will depend on the edges that acted upon it. And I think this is a very good figure that Miles made in the paper that he just put out recently to compare the graph network with certain Newtonian mechanics. Um, you can see it's a fairly simple network. It's not super complex. And each of the graph network pieces sort of naturally corresponds to the Newtonian mechanics fairly well with the nose, the pairs of the nose, the edge model, and even how you actually pull the messages to back together because you're summing the net force all into the one single node. And then you update the nodes when you compute the next time step. And there's these two parts, these two sets of black boxes that we'll use to approximate with symbolic regression, which you also heard about before. So the outcome, can we actually approximate them quite well? If I can click them all together, apparently yes, but if I cannot click them together, you can't see whether they're actually fairly similar. You'll see it very soon in the next slide, um, a couple of slides from here. Um, we can also learn all these different um, systems, the M body systems, the balls bouncing the basically empty box, 
and springs falling onto a mass. This was all done, and I think mouse reproduced a significant number of them. It was done before by Peter Vitaglia's group in 2016, and we reproduced most of these systems also with the graphical neural net. This is the 1,000 step rollout of you know, the true versus the predicted on the top and the bottom. And you can see that they're doing pretty well. The balls bouncing within the walls are not so good because it's actually fairly um, hard collisions, I think. Any small areas will propagate quite a bit. And this is the zero, quote unquote, zero shot generalization to a larger system where we were training it with these number of balls or this length of string, of spring system. And you can see that they're okay, but they're not perfect. But the central ones, like the one with the balls in the box is definitely the hardest to do. There's interesting parts that I kind of hinted at earlier where people should be thinking about looking at the global properties where you could imagine using the global properties to do better predictions, such as using these uh, Lagrangian neural net and Hamiltonian neural net. Um, Sam Granatis has written a paper on Hamiltonian neural net earlier, um, and Miles actually came and wrote about Lagrangian neural net, which I think is also a very important piece of work that um, it really is a demonstration of how physics can be very interesting and useful, even for machine learning, which is, you know, extremely um, exciting these days. But I won't be talking about it because it's too much. So let's concentrate on predicting the dynamics so that now that we have a network that have predicted the dynamics properly. So what do we do? We would extract the symbolic equation, but how do we do that explicitly? with this graphical neural net. Let's see. So you want to encourage a low dimensionality in particular. And in this case, we apply the L1 regularization. We've actually done a bunch of different ones. I think this is the one that I end up choosing and using. And then we can try to, uh, let me just go back one step. So given the input is only 2D, we do not expect the dimension of the edge factor to be larger than two. And we want to basically figure out what the edges, edge functions were. Though we find that limiting it to two immediately makes the training longer and the performance is not as good. Doesn't mean it's not possible. We tried a bunch of other methods and we decided in the end to use L1 regularization to minimize the number of message elements that are important to fit the observable to the predictions. Then we put this element, uh, this edge elements through the symbolic regression and see what would fit for these two elements. And it turned out that these actually give you the correct true force afterwards. And we also recovered other force laws for springs in 2D and one over R square law in 3D. So this is all semi-simple because we kind of know what the forces are and we kind of expected it to be easy. Um, so we decided to do something a little bit harder or at least something that we do not know the answer ahead of the time. So here is a simulation that we probably shown a lot of times. It's a dark matter simulation with hydrodynamics forces. It's called Illustris project, where to simulate a significant chunk of the universe, you know, for a very long time. And the dark matter particles are the blue ones, well, originally blue ones. And you have some explosion of galaxies and all that. But the key point here is that as the universe moves forward, you have these um, coagulation of particles that form big clusters. And these cluster, we call them halos. And they are basically metropolitan cities of galaxies, if you would like to think of it that way. And it's a fairly complex situation that's happening right here. As you can see, a supernova exploding and pushing gas around. It's showing the gas temperature right now. That's why you can see all this um, very strong influence by the exploding stars. I believe right now it's showing the heavy metals where they are. So with this complex universe, we want to ask ourselves, you know, for just the dark matter side, for the dark matter halo, can we predict the density of the dark matter within the center of these halos, the center of the metropolitan cities of galaxies, given all the surrounding halos, the surrounding metropolitan cities of galaxies? We can make guesses of what this answer may be like, but we don't know this analytical formula from previous work. So that's what we challenge ourselves with. Um, 
we put in this detailed dark matter simulations, not the one I showed you earlier, but it, this is the one that just have only dark matter. And you can see where the dots are actually here. So I'm pointing with my fingers and realize you won't see them. Um, these dots are where we'll put all the dark matter halos. And you want to say for this dark matter halo, the central density in, of this dark matter halo, what is it? when you put in all the other nodes in this graph right here, okay? So we want to ask ourselves, if I have all the information about all the other dark matter halos, but not about the filaments, not about you know all the empty spaces, what can it tell us about the central density of this dark matter halo, which we don't know a priori. So we don't even have sort of a prior on this. So can we find that equation? And you can see that this is the equation we end up having in that form, but we didn't know a priori and we did not set up this way. So we end up finding a new analytical formula that fit to the observable better than we can fit using just simple physical intuition. We can make guesses. You know, Physicists are good at making some guesses at least. Um, this is the, the old ones that we can have guesses say, how about it's a constant, it's not working very well. How about something very simple that depends on the mass of the halo and also all the halo masses around it. So E here is sum over all the halo masses around it. And you can see that it's actually this simple guess is doing decently because you know that it is gonna de depend on the masses, how massive it is around of all the halos all around it. And then we have made other suggestions using the symbolic regression and found out that quite different formula actually for these two. One is the best one with mass that we allow the use of masses of all the dark matter halos where you can see that this formula with a better um, error is not something that we would have guessed right away. And then the other formula, we deliberately disallow using masses because mass is not something that we observe right away in you know, any of the galaxy surveys. And we do sometimes observe the velocities of the galaxies and you can get some velocities about um, the halos. And you can use that possibly to help determine the density, central density of the dark matter halo. So we do that and realize you can find other formula that it's okay, but it's not perfect when you only, if you only allowed access without the mass. So we thought that was pretty interesting that with symbolic regression, we're able to find a new formula that wasn't in the form that we expected, which is what we sort of expect here. And even that form is not very similar to what we expected before, which also fits better. So we're still in search of an answer why this is the case. And you know, we definitely welcome a lot of different suggestions. Uh, just looking at the equations there, I mean, it, it looks like you're just replacing M and B as though they were like uh, completely correlated variables. Is that they they are correlated variables, and that's why you can actually derive M from V um, if you only have V. But they are it's a little bit more complex. But it's, you know, you have to assume that the halo does a certain type of halos are like more relaxed if the halos are doing funny things. It's a bit different. So as I'm just looking at these equations, I'm wondering what is the value of C7? Because the exponent, right? Mm -hmm. Miles, do you remember what C7 exactly <laughs> is? I don't remember. Like 21, it's a very sharp uh, cutoff. Oh, wow. And that's uh, because we use a top hat smoothing function when we calculate the overdensity. So it's, it's actually trying to like mimic the um, smoothing. 21, yes. wow, okay. Yeah, so this is sort of a question of, you know, what does this mean? But there are interesting questions that I think we can answer with this idea because right now, you know, our next questions we'll be asking includes you know, whether you can put in the right galaxies in these halos and how are these galaxies dependent on the surrounding? And this is, I wouldn't say a million dollar problem because we probably spend more than a million dollar on this to try to understand the dependence of galaxies on its environment, for example. Mm -hmm. And now we can try to do this with, you know, symbolic regression combined with these new techniques. So I'm kind of excited.
So what other things graph network can do? Um, this is something that is related to something else we're doing too. We can predict the invisible springs in a spring mass system. So this is the input. That's the model. And you can predict where the springs are. And Miles and I and some other colleagues in uh, UCL, we're actually looking at you know so planetary system data and try to see whether we can find like you know the extra planet nine that we don't know where they are. And there's an interesting discussion of whether we can find these missing components that we know is there and is affecting our system very slightly. So can we locate them? Same thing for these point light walkers. It's kind of cool that you can figure out where the invisible springs are. So that's another example. And I'll just conclude quickly because it's supposed to be a short talk and have questions. Uh, human intuitions and physical intuitions help us create new ways to think about how to do machine learning. I think these new ways of doing machine learning such as graphical neural net help us simulate what we can see in the real world way faster. There are definitely still a lot of drawbacks sometimes to use graphical neural net. Um, but I think it's, it's quite interesting where we are already. What is more intriguing is even for the physical laws we don't know the answer to, or you know, analytical equations, we might not want to call them physical laws yet. We can observe the system and let these machine learning algorithms to help us find the analytical expression. So I'll pause here and take questions. <laughs>